do an audio sync, and we're rolling. This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with Brian Tate on February 28, 2020 at 1.30 p.m. We're located in the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we begin, could you please state and spell your first and last name for the transcriber? My first name is Brian, B-R-Y-A-N. I have two middle names, Charles and William. My last name is Tate, T-A-T-E. Thank you. Before we talk about your time in Vietnam and the military, let's get a little biographic information. When and where were you born? I was born uh, in Toronto, Ontario in, uh, on February the 4th, 1945. Wow. And uh, this, the story about that is my dad was, uh, my dad was a, a army uh, person uh, that uh, was drafted in 1939 and he was in stationed at Fort Belvoir. He met my mother. My mother was a Canadian citizen that had actually uh, gone to Washington, D.C. to work for the Australian Embassy. The Can Canada and Australia were all part of the Commonwealth, so she could go go there. She went with her, with her girlfriend, met my dad at a USO dance, and uh, they were married in 1942. And Dad got orders uh, to go with the Third Army, General Patton, to, uh, to North Africa. And he went to North Africa and all through Sicily, and he hit the second wave at Anzio. And then he came home and that's when I was conceived and he, but he wasn't allowed to have time off so I, as I understand it they didn't have maternity leave back in the 40s and so uh, my mother decided when it was time for me to be born to go up to be with her family in Toronto. I was born at the Salvation Army Hospital, Grace Salvation Army Hospital in Toronto. <laughs> but a Dual citizen? According to Canada, yes. The U.S., no. No. So my yeah. mother told me that I had the option and went until I was uh, 16 as dual citizen. Then at 16, I would live in the country of my choice for five years, and then I would uh, give up the right to the other country. And, and so, obviously, we were living, growing up in Dayton, Ohio, and so I remember 16, and I remember 21. I said, well, there goes Canada, you there know. There goes that, Canada. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but, and then later in my career, after coming home from Vietnam, I was actually uh, took a job where I was assigned. Uh, one of my duty responsibilities was to move to Canada. So I went through the whole process of becoming a landed immigrant. It took six months. You had to have police reports from every place <laughs> you lived since you were 16. I get to the border, and the guy says, "Where were you born?" I said, "Toronto." He said, "Come on in." I said, "What?" Well, <laughs> I didn't need the paper at didn't all. Didn't need the paper at all. So uh, anyway, that's when I discovered that Toronto still, unless I had renounced the citizenship, still viewed me as a dual citizen. And I think the Americans have given up that thing. They, you can hang on to both of them. Oh, really? Or m even more, I guess. Yeah. Who were your family members? Well, my dad was Charles William Tate, and my mother was Olive, Olive Elizabeth Burrell, and then when they were married, she became Olive Elizabeth Tate. And uh, I'm the first of, of uh, four children, and the oldest of four children. I have right. a younger brother that was uh, four years younger than me, another one that's five years younger than me, and then my little sister came along 16 years later. So. Wow. <laughs> Autumn surprise they should have named her. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, believe me, uh, growing up there were three boys in the house and then four if you count on my dad, and my mother always used to say that she said, well, you know, the good Lord didn't give me any girls, so you boys are going to have to learn to do what girls do. And she taught me how to clean bathrooms and iron. Yeah. And my other brother got, and they were younger, so they didn't have quite the duty schedule that I did. So anyway. What do you consider your hometown? Where are you? Did you move around a lot? Well, I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. I yeah. was only in Canada for six weeks, I think. And then yeah. mom came back, and, and uh, we lived with my dad's parents in uh, Dayton. And that's where I grew up until, um, until I went to college in 1963. Okay, and uh, you were drafted yes, in sir, I, 1968? I graduated from college in March of 1968 and, and got drafted in April. I didn't think the government could do anything that fast, but Tet 68, I think, sort of turned... Turned the faucet turned on. The, it did. They, they needed some, some, more, some more people. After I got Did my they draft offer notice, you I, OCS? Or? Oh, yeah. They wanted me to sign up for five years. I did very well on their test scores. And uh, but 
I, I just really didn't think, and I maybe had something to do with the, with the state of the Vietnam War. I just didn't really have a desire to, to st make it a career. Mm. And so uh, I tried to join the Marines, the Navy, and the Air Force after I got my draft notice, but none of them would talk to me. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. I think they had orders that the Army needed recruits and stay out hands of their off, way. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so they draft you. Where do they send you for basic training? So I reported for active duty on July 18th, um, and they, uh, at the bottom of the federal building in Dayton, Ohio, called the Knot Building, and then they, uh, we spent some time there. The Salvation Army was there at 5.30 in the morning uh, playing music and giving coffee and donuts, and then they loaded us up on a bus and took us down to Cincinnati, Ohio, to the federal building down there. And that's where we went through all of our in-processing, uh, physical, um, sw swearing allegiance, taking two steps forward, the, the whole nine yards. And then- Bend over and cough. <laughs> yeah, bend over, yes. And, uh, and then they loaded us on a, an airplane l much later that night and flew us down to Atlanta. And then they loaded us on a bus and took us to Fort Benning. We arrived at Fort Benning about 2.30 in the morning. Oh, well, it's good you didn't see Columbus, Georgia passing through. <laughs> no, but the first thing they did was we met our drill sergeant, and the first thing they did was uh, we had a police call, and so I didn't, we didn't know what police call was, but told us to pick up everything we could see that didn't move, and, and including the big three-inch cockroaches that they have down there. Oh. <laughs> All right, and uh, you got through basic. You, where did you you did AIT there? No, I went. To, I finished basic in July and August at Fort Benning, and it was hot and humid down there. It was actually, uh, and they have bamboo down there, and and so uh, I didn't think it'd get any worse than that until they sent me to Fort Polk for AIT. That's and, worse. And it worse it is definitely worse, and they have critters in Fort Polk. Oh, they do. And actually, I was on an escape and evasion one night and got chased by a pig. And oh, uh, wild boar! It, well, I didn't it, know that at the time. It but, takes but the your first leg sergeant off. told me. He said, "You're lucky that that pig would have hurt you." He said, "It wasn't a pig; it was a hog." And he said, "It would hurt you if you yeah, if you yeah, caught you." It take <laughs> your leg off at the knee. <laughs> All right, so you go through AIT. Your MOS is obviously cast in stone. Your infantry. 114BP. Uh, 114P. Yeah. All right. Do you? How do you get selected to go to the NCO school? Well, we, they moved us back to Fort Benning. I think I went back to jump school first, okay. and then I was in Fort Benning, and then. I might have that backwards, but uh, I, I actually was recruited to, so they tried to get me to go to OCS, and that meant more years, and so they said, well, you can go to the NCO school, and there's not additional commitment time, so I did that, and uh, there were 300 of us in our NCO class, and... Uh, How long did that last? It seems to me that it was a couple months long. It was pretty extensive. Pretty intense. A lot of uh, a lot of tests, a lot of books, uh, plus physical training. As I said, there was a big component of, of uh, ranger training. We went through. There were the uh, uh, OCS troops were right next to us, so we felt like we went through the same the same <laughs> program. And uh, but some of the obstacle courses in the ranger obstacle courses were pretty uh, pretty tough. I remember those. They put the uh, actors through a mini basic for the movie We Were Soldiers, and so you had Mel Gibson and Sam Elliott out there do, running the Ranger obstacle course. And uh, toughest thing for me was the walking the log, where you had to climb up and then walk across that little narrow board on top of the telephone pole, and then go over the steps and then out to the end where you had a rope and you had to go out and touch the ranger tab and then, uh, and then uh, request permission to drop. Oh. And uh, I requested permission to drop. I was lucky to get to the other side. My fingerprints are still on that metal pole, <laughs> I can tell you that for sure. And the rope was no problem. And uh, I got to the thing, the drill sergeant said, look up and drop. And I looked up 
but my hands didn't let go of the rope. <laughs> so he started hollering at me. He said, I told you to drop. And finally, I was able to talk my hands into letting go of the rope, and it seemed like forever before I hit the water. Yeah. And so, anyway. Uh... you receive any further training before you got orders to Vietnam? Uh, well, we went through the, the NCO, cor NCO course was, um, was a, a course that involved training and, and as I said there were about 300 of us and a lot of it was a combination of taking tests and learning from textbooks and then all, there was also field operations where you learned how to read a map and read a compass and we'd have that in basic and AIT but this was more extensive. And, yeah. uh, I did well with that, and then you also had to have peer reviews. So, in order to get your final grade, they they had all of your your company uh, had to report on everybody. So you had to do, report that on everybody. But it, the, you needed in order to to finish in the top the top five people were were commission or were uh, awarded a staff sergeant. Everybody else, if you graduated, was, was going to be a three-striper three -stripe sergeant. So I was fortunate enough to finish at the very top of my class. I was promoted to Staff Sergeant E6. Wow, very good. And uh, so. <clears throat> Do you think that that training prepared you for what you faced once you arrived in Vietnam? I, th I think it did the answer to that I would say yes and no. I think that the military training was very valuable, but I don't, I don't think any amount of training could have prepared me to be in a firefight or combat or shoot, you know, engage with with that sort of thing. I mean, that's something that you do and you learn how to do it, and then you do it again and you learn more. And and uh, so, uh, but the I think the combat training was was very helpful, and certainly for me. Map and compass training were very helpful because we didn't have any technology the way the young men have it, or young men and women have it today. That's right. No uh, GPS out there. So uh, it's the sergeant and the lieutenant arguing over where we are. Exactly right. And let's drop in around a Willie Peter, and then we'll know. Well, and and it was important because we operated on ambush patrols every day, and what they would do is they would set every all the platoons down at about seven o'clock at night, and you had to be where. They, you told them you were, because if you weren't, then they would start firing, harassing and interdicting fire at night. And if you were not in the right location, that was not a <laughs> yeah, good thing to be. Not a good thing. That's right. <laughs> so fortunately, I was pretty good with a map and a compass, so I kept my platoon safe. One time, we did get a little, we weren't misoriented, but we were not completely sure, so I got the radio and I started tuning to an aviation uh, channel, and I got this, uh, must have been a forward air controller, but he was an Australian guy. And uh, I asked him if he could help me with a, with some just confirming my directions. And so he asked us to pop smoke. We did, and he sent us an encrypted GPS or a coordinate, you know, for for where we were. And sure enough, we were where we thought we'd be. Uh, I, I thanked him profusely and told him I'd buy him a beer if I ever. I don't even know who he was, but, <laughs> but I bought a lot of Australians beer now because of that very guy. Because of that one guy. Yep. Well, maybe you'll get him one day. <laughs> Uh, how old were you when you arrived in Vietnam? Uh, 24. 24. I was 23. Uh, how did you get to Vietnam and where did you land? So we, we left from McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. We had spent a night, we had to report to Fort Dix and then I think it was the next day or the next day or so we reported to Fort McGuire to get on the plane. We flew from Fort McGuire to Elmendorf in Alaska. I think we spent a night in Elmen Elmendorf, or maybe we just uh, were on the plane, but uh, I remember it was dark. And then we went from Elmendorf to Yokota, Japan to refuel. I don't recall getting off the plane. And then from there, we flew to Benoit. To Benoit. Yep. And, and this is 1969, what month? It was 69. In September. Okay. September. And we uh, we landed in Benoit at around noon. And I remember the pilot. There was a stretch eight. There were about 300 of us on the on the plane. 
and I remember the pilot telling us it was going to be a fairly abrupt landing. <laughs> and he, he was quite serious about yeah. that. He put that thing into a nosedive and it spiraled all the way down. I mean, it was quite memorable. And then when he got, a, when he got on the ground, he came on the, on the radio and he said, it, you couldn't make a low approach. He said it was very dangerous. Very they dangerous. Wanted to shoot those planes down, right? So, <laughs> but anyway, it was hot and humid when I hit the ground. So I suspect that the, it grabbed you when you went through that open door. It did. All right now. Are you a, do you have an assignment or they run you through the repo depot? I landed, they sent us to 90th replacement and, uh, and they, we checked in and we got there at noon in the daytime and so by the time we got all through all of that they fed us and, and then they assigned us some barracks right at the replacement station. And uh, we spent the night there and then the following day we went to, to get our assignments at the personnel section there. And the where night. did they assign you? They, they sent me to the, um, the night that we stayed at 90th replacement, somebody uh, opened up a CS canister and we got uh, smoked tear gas. And, <laughs> and so I, I, you know, you just never knew what to expect. Here you are in a strange country and it's hot and steamy and- And you got tear gas. I got tear gas. And so by then the next day I told the, the placement, uh, I think it was a spec four. I told him, I said, you know, my buddy, who went just two weeks before me? We threw all basic and, and all that training together. I said, I said he he's with the first infantry division. So he said, well, I can't make any promises. So I got my orders, and they were the first infantry division. But it was the second battalion, 28th infantry, and Mike was in a different bunch. I never different. did see him. Never did see. <laughs> I never did see. Him. So, <clears throat> so they sent me to the Charlotte Company, the second battalion, 28th infantry, and their headquarters were in uh, Dao Tiang. But uh, we had to go to Xeon first for uh, a little jungle training, and yeah. then they give you your M16, and you zero it in, and uh, and then they would sent they sent me from there to Lai K. They actually, because I was the ranking NCO, they made me in charge of a convoy, and which was <laughs> a little nervous. Here I was in country for maybe two or three days, four days at the most. They gave me a flak jacket and a steel pot and an M16 and told me to lead this convoy. It was a huge convoy. Oh my God. 25 trucks or something <laughs> like that through enemy territory to Lai Kei. Uh, yeah. We made that and did it and I didn't get in trouble or nobody got hurt. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, they spent a couple of days in Lai Kei, then they put us on a, a bus and sent me up to Dao Tiang, uh, which was our You've... division, or our, our brigade rear. Okay, and yeah. you caught up with Charlie Company at that point, or did you have to go into the field? Well, they, the Charlie Company had a, a brigade rear there, and so I caught up with them, but then they loaded me on a deuce and a half and sent me out to my fire base. And we were at, I was stationed at Fire, base, uh, fire Support Base Keene, which was, uh, used to be Fire Support Base Mahone. But when they had the Vietnamization process, they designated uh, this fire base to be a model for Vietnamization. So half the fire base was Vietnamese and half of it was U.S. And as you know, a fire base is about 300 meters in diameter with concertina wire and bunkers and all that. And so it was divided right down the middle and half of it was uh, Arvin uh, and, and the other half was U.S., our, our group. So Now when you get there, are you assigned to a platoon? I was. I was assigned to the first platoon. As a platoon sergeant? Well, they didn't, yes, as a platoon sergeant, but when I went there, there wasn't any platoon leader. In fact, there was a E3 run in the platoon. Oh my God. <laughs> so I got there in the, in the daytime and he was giving me a little bit of a rundown, you know, and he was a very seasoned, he had been in the, in the company for quite a while, so he was very seasoned, <laughs> I was not seasoned, and, uh, but I was in charge. And so that was, uh, the training didn't quite prepare me for that <laughs> so back in Fort Benning. So, uh, but I mean, it was what it was, and so I took command of the of the platoon, and I think we had 18 or 19 guys, and and uh, it's so, about half of what you should have had. Yeah, I think TOD was 31, and we never had a more than 19. Most often it was 17 or 18 with new guys coming in, people going home, D Rose, and then also R and R. So. 
<clears throat> so you, the, you're, the first the, night. you're the platoon commander now. Oh, I spent the first night uh, uh, out in the bush, and it uh, it rained, and it was I've never been so miserable and scared in all my life. <laughs> <laughs> and then to hear the lizards talk at night, you've probably heard the lizards, and so anyway. He wants to know what a shake and bake loot uh, NCO is. That was the name that they gave to us because it was sort of a 90-day process. They called us uh, a, a number of things that weren't uh, nearly as uh, flattering as shake and bake, but instant NCOs and and uh, other non uh, uh, warming uh, titles. Were you treated differently? Uh, I think we were treated differently when we came home mm. because people, if you, like, you know, I, as I said, I went from E1 to E6 in a very relatively short period of time. You know, right. some, some members, as you know and probably know, that, you know, spend years go making to get to the rank of E6. Yeah. And so I think there was some resentment on that part. You know, it's, it's probably no different than a lieutenant that's a 90-day wonder. My dad went through OCS after he came back from from Ger or from uh, uh, Italy at Anzio. He, he went through OCS, and he was an E6 in in uh, with Patton's group, and then became a second lieutenant. And they he said they called him a shave tail and a 90-day wonder. You know, yeah, so, <laughs> and a bunch of other things. A bunch of other stuff too. Uh, What were living conditions like, firebase and in the field? Well, in the firebase, uh, if we were spending the night there, which we did usually about once every four to eight days, depending upon the mission length, uh, uh, some of the guys would have hammocks that they would string between two stakes, or some people would just sleep in the in the bunker. Uh, but that was that was it. We had a day room, but it was didn't really have any beds in it, and it was a, basically a tent. So you were you had to fend for yourself. I had a hammock, a little hammock that I picked up from from somebody. At, uh, the Vietnamese used to use hammocks to sleep in all the time, and then you collect one or you find one, and that's what I I slept in when I was back in the rear. But most of the time, we were out on ambush uh, ambush patrol. We ambushed every night, and. Uh, so we would sleep, we'd take a poncho, not a poncho liner. I didn't get a poncho liner until I left the country, so. <laughs> but uh, you would sleep, sort of make it sandwich style, and hopefully you learned that you you have the round part, the uphill. Uphill. <laughs> it took so a while to learn that, but yeah, <laughs> otherwise well. in the middle of the night it's a monsoon rain and you just filled up with water, you know. That's so. it. <laughs> <laughs> take you off down the hill. Yep. So, uh, uh, but we would ambush uh, every night. We were out in the field, and it was sleeping on the ground. We'd have to have you didn't dig in on ambush. We did not. No. Yeah. Now a lot of the different uh, units that I was told did dig in, but but our method was not. Yeah. And we had something called uh, eagle flights, and so the way that we did the ambushes, they would uh, pick my platoon up in four Hueys and take us up in the air and fly us around for 20 or 30 minutes and then sit us down someplace. And, and then we had uh, orders then to go from that location to wherever we were supposed to be that night. Sometimes it was two clicks, sometimes it was 15 clicks. Whoa. So you had to, and it depended on the terrain, some of it could have been. And they land you in the dark. Well, yeah, they, they usually landed us in the light. Ah. Uh, yeah, and, and in the daytime. And then usually sometime in the late morning. And by the time we got picked up, go to the pickup site, get on the choppers, take off, fly around for a while, and then they would put us down at a different location, and we had orders to go from there to uh, where Point our ambush eight. was that night. Yeah. That's correct. So, interesting. So I had a lot of <coughs> helicopter rides when I, was, when I was over there. Yeah, I bet. Describe your friendships with and your impressions of, of the people that you were soldiering with. 
Well, when I first got there, of course, I got uh, put in charge right away, and so I, I took that seriously. And I, I didn't have, I didn't know anybody. I mean, I just met them, you know. Hi, I'm Brian, you know, or Sergeant Tate. And, and so I think for a while it was sort of guarded. Uh, but after a while, especially after being in the field and being in some firefights, and then you sort of know who you can count on and who's there and which squad leader and which squad is going to really step up, you know. And after a while, you come become close to those guys. And, and after a while longer than that, you're really close to those guys. And I think a lot of the heroism that's, that's happened uh, is not so much a person just wants to be a hero, but they're out there trying to save their buddy yeah. or, save, or save this guy over here. You know, I mean, I watch people... Uh, in a firefight, I had a guy from Puerto Rico. I'm not even sure he was a U.S. citizen. His name was Hernandez, and he he shot our M60. He was our M60 gunner, one of them. We had two, and we were gotten a nasty firefight. And he was sitting cross-legged behind that gun, shooting. Mm -hmm. So I mean, most everybody else was down as yep. low as you could get, trying yeah. to look up at ants, you know. And and so he was amazing. So. It's amazing what sights you see. But guys you, you are do. willing to risk their own lives for a buddy. Exactly right, and you saw that, and 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 you you do you become uh, you become pretty close to these guys. You still have to maintain that military order. So when we'd get ready to go out on a patrol, it was my job to make sure everybody had all their stuff, especially all of their their uh, weapons and ammo stuff. So we carried. 18 magazines of M16 rounds, a bandolier. We, had, we carried claymores. We carried uh, two hand grenades, and so I would go around and check to see. And I, my one squad leader, didn't have all this stuff. Well, by the time you loaded up C rations, your your all your stuff in your pack. I mean, sometimes those rucksacks would weigh 90 pounds, and and so the guys would, if they if they could, they didn't carry everything. So I had to. Talk to them and make sure they go back make and sure get, they get go their hand grenades, get, get your claymores, and load up, you know. <laughs> and so I saw guys throw away <laughs> writing paper because it was too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Did you form friendships with men from different racial and social backgrounds during your time in Vietnam? Uh, I did, but they, they would, didn't really think of it as racial. I mean, they were just people and men in my platoon. Yeah. We all counted on each other. I mean, I had a a guy from Hawaii, he was my other M60 gunner. And the poor guy had boils. Oh dear. We called him pineapple. He was a native Hawaiian. Yeah. And and uh, he called me a Howley, which is a bad nickname for a white <laughs> person a, that's not other, a Hawaiian. <laughs> the other version of gringo. <laughs> that's right. And so, but he was, he had these giant massive boils all over his body and he had them on his shoulders. Oh, oh. And of course the strap to the M60 is heavy. Yeah. And I sent him to the medics and they would do what they did Lance to him. Lance their boils. Exactly right. And he'd come back with little wicks sticking out of him. And I, I, uh. the medic said, he's just allergic to Vietnam. Yeah, but he was a great guy. His name was Moniz, Henry Moniz, and great, great guy. And uh, and then you know we we'd go different ways after he'd go, he'd leave or go home. Or uh, the guy probably I was closest to was my squad leader, uh, Steve Bainey, who um, who was the one I had to send back to get his hand grenades and his claymores. <laughs> and I I chewed him out pretty good and, and just told him I said right in front of the, the platoon because I said you know guys. We all depend on each other, and if we're out there and somebody's not doesn't have the right equipment, and we're in a firefight, I said that could be the difference. And so, he went back, but he and I became very very close, um, and uh, so we all got assigned. I'm getting, probably getting ahead of your questions, but when the first decided to go home, the first infantry division, we all got reassigned mm. to different units. He got assigned to Marical Division. I sent him a letter, and the letter came back KIA. Yeah. Uh. I mean, it was, it's still, to this day. And out of all the places he could have been assigned, that yeah. not exactly a good one. Yeah. So you do form friendships, uh, and, and once again, I, you didn't think about them as, 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 you know, I had a guy from, uh, had uh, several African Americans who were great soldiers. I had uh, uh, some, a guy that, came to us, he was a new uh, twink that came in, a new guy, new guy, twinks, <laughs> and uh, 
he was from Oklahoma. He was a redhead. He was that. Uh, <laughs> that awful. Uh, yeah, and then he would get suntan through his fatigue jacket, and those things were pretty heavy. You wondered, and he'd roll it up and show me the burn on his arm. I oh said, my God. Man. But anyway, I don't know how he survived Oklahoma, much less <laughs> Vietnam. I know. He was from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. <laughs> oh dear. So. Now back home, you know, the country's on fire. There's anti-war demonstrations. There's race riots and assassinations. Does any of that come over to where you are? It. We saw back in the rear. When I say the rear, back at the fire support base. <laughs> You'd go back there to clean your weapons and resupply. We'd do that every once or four, five, six, seven, eight days, depending on how long we were out for the mission. Uh, and uh, we'd see uh, s some people with black power. Oh, yeah. In, you know, and, and, but uh, they were kind of rear area people. Exactly. But my guys, I mean, a couple of my guys would have a a shoelace bracelet that they braided, you know, and, and I guess it was black and I guess it had something to do with it, but I didn't notice any of that out in the field. And we lost some guys that were, in fact, my one of my point men was a black man from South Carolina, and uh, it was just a huge tragedy when, when I lost him, so. Now, I doesn't doubt this applies very much to you, but if you, when you had any time off, what did you do for recreation? We didn't really have any time off except for R&R, &R. and uh, so I, I, I took my R&R &R, uh, to go to Tokyo. I was going to take, you, you got a seven day leave and then you got an R&R. &R. I only ever took the R&R. &R. In my seven-day leave, I was going to go to Australia because of that uh, forward air controller that helped me out, but it didn't didn't work out that way. So, uh, and then one time, my platoon, we the first the th we had three platoons and then a weapons platoon. So I was the first platoon, and second and third, and they, and the company commander would take turns rotating us back into our fire support base, based on who was up next to go back in. If you, and the good news about going back into the support base first was that they had resupplied the cooler with Cokes and, and you would have a, a, a five gallon container that had been sitting in the sun all day so you could get a, a relatively warm shower and a Coke. And, but if, if you were like second or third platoon to go back in, you, you got grape knee high or wink and cold water for the shower. So oh, yeah. uh, one day, uh, and I don't know if you call this recreation, we did, but uh, the company commander called us and said we were getting picked up at 700 in the morning and it was going to be a Chinook and normally they didn't use Chinooks out in the field and he said it was going to be a hot extraction. So hot extractions mean you put out claymores and then you blow them as you as you uh, pull back and then get on the chopper. We got on the chopper of my whole platoon and I asked the pilot, I said where are we going? He wouldn't give me any information so we got up, flew around for probably 30-40 minutes, I can't recall and, and uh, we landed at Lyke and this was like December 22nd, and they chose us, my platoon, to go to see Bob Hope. Ah. And so we spent the whole, we got there like seven o'clock in the morning, 7.30 in the morning, and Bob Hope didn't come on until like four o'clock in the afternoon, but, and we hadn't been, you know, we just came out of the field after being in the field for like four or five days. So you were a little grubby. A little grubby and no place to clean up, but it, let me tell you, it was great because it was secure, <laughs> and there were, you could get some food, and so some hot food, and so that was great. And snooze a little, nap yeah, exactly. if you like. Take a nap yeah. <laughs> in a secure area. So, but other than that, that's how was that show? It was great. And do you know who I was had, the dancing girl? Well, they had uh, Connie Stevens. Yeah. And so I told you earlier that uh, that I have two middle initials or two middle names, Charles and William. So she gets up there, and she and this crowd is unbelievable. It's a huge crowd. There were thousands of soldiers out there. And she gets up there on the microphone and she said, I'm going to sing this song. And she said, I want to have a volunteer, anybody named Bill. So I raised my hand because my Brian Charles William Bill Tate, right? Yeah. So I raised my hand, but I didn't get picked. About half the other whole Every audience other raised their hand. There. She picked some guy up and she came up and she sang the song Bill and to him and hugged him while she was singing it. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. So I didn't get picked. And then also they had... Uh, uh, Teresa Graves and the Gold Diggers. 
Yeah. <laughs> and here you've been in the field for seven or eight months, and that's the first round-eyed girls you've seen in a long time. I mean, they had donut dogs, but they didn't come out to the field, <laughs> not out to the not out to the fire support bases. Yeah. They would be back in the base camps, and they did a great job. But but the gold diggers were the first. Uh, American females that we had, and of course, Miss Stevens, and, and, and then he had some other men there that were funny, some comedians and so forth, but uh, those women sure were good looking at that time. Yeah. <laughs> now, you you mentioned that, that they started pulling the 1st Cav, 1st uh, Infantry out, and you were reassigned to whom? So, I was... Uh, I was reassigned to the 173rd Airborne Brigade because I was jump qualified. And the 173rd, you know, the 101st and the 82nd were already over there, but they had become leg units. Yeah. So they were not airborne qualified. The 173rd was still, and it was a separate brigade, so it was still on jump status. So I guess they took me there, and jump status meant 90% of the entire brigade had to be jump qualified. Yeah. And so uh, they sent me up there. That was up in Northern Tukor in a place called Bong Song right on the South China Sea. Know it well, I've soldiered through there. And, uh, but prior to, prior to that, um, the, the battalion commander, uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Richard Hobbs, had recommended me for a battlefield commission. And so I had, uh, I had, he told me, he said, it's gonna be, take six weeks to get through Congress, and then you'd be, promoted to second lieutenant, and then you'd have a one-year obligation in country after you became a second lieutenant. And the reason they were doing it, because they were short of second lieutenants, right? Yeah. And there was a reason for that, probably. And I thought about it. I only had about, I think, five months left to go or something like that, maybe on six. Your enlist, on your on draft my time or... in, in uh, Vietnam. Down. And so um, I turned it down. I was always sort of wondered if I should have done that, but you can't look backwards. Can't look back. So anyway, I turned that down, but then when, in January, when they announced that the first was going to be going home, he selected me to be one of 30 men to go back with the colors, back to Fort Riley, Kansas. And so mm. I was so pr tickled to pink, I was going to get to go home early, and I wrote my mom and dad, and told them I'm coming home early. And then they had a change of command, so General Malloy, who was in charge of the first division, was too short, or too, he had needed to stay in country, so they had a, a another general changed command and then he said he looked at the list and he said nobody with more than 30 days is going to go back to Fort Riley so I got reassigned to the 173rd Airborne Brigade and I had to write my mom and tell her I'm not coming home so uh, time out time out <laughs> she was not happy where was the 173rd operating at that point that was, they were in Bong Song in Bong Song in Northern Tukor correct LZ English it was close to LZ English, but uh, but it was actually a, a, a division, a brigade rear. So uh, our commanding officer, General Cunningham, and he was, and we had a, a, a big uh, you know, helicopter uh, uh, place there with with all the one, uh, 173rd helicopters. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, their their logo on the front of the helicopters were two dice, and so the helicopter uh, runway area where they kept all the planes was called the crap table. <laughs> but, and while that was sort of funny, it, being out of the field, and they, the personnel officer, when I reported for duty, looked at my 201 file and he said, well, it looks like you've got enough ribbons here and you've been in combat. He said, uh, I need somebody in the headquarters company. Would you be interested in that? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and so and that assignment, stays back? Well, they were in the, I, I stayed then in the, in the brigade rear. Uh, and so I was uh, NCOIC for our, our, our brigade, our headquarters company. No and more hump in the boonies. No more hump in the boonies, but I can tell you, being in the rear is not a, is not a bargain because we got rocketed every single night, 122 millimeter rockets coming in. And, and when those things came in, you, you had to hit the ground and, and you could hear them. They would start on the helicopter uh, landing strip to blow up helicopters and then they would walk them across the compound. You could just hear them moving, you know, mm. and it took about two minutes, I guess, to get counter mortar out, and then our the outgoing once that's once we got artillery going the other direction, they stopped firing. Yeah, but it was it was pretty scary being back in the rear. <laughs>
Can you describe the quality of the leadership in the first division and the 173rd as high up as you could see it? As high as I could see it was our battalion commander. I didn't see anybody above that. Um, and But he was a great leader, and I say that because he was a fair-complected guy, and he would get out there and he'd have this white... Uh, sunscreen on his nose yeah <laughs> you could see him zinc. for a long way is that what it was it was yeah. zinc. and you yeah. could see him a long way away but he was right out there shoulder to shoulder with the company commanders and with the with the people in the field so i i gave him full credit for that i mean i had heard that a lot of times that the high-ranking officer stayed in the back stayed in or the bunker, stayed in the or helicopter, stayed in the helicopter overhead. yeah so it telling uh, you how fast you got to go down on the ground so Colonel Hobbs was right out there with, with us, and so and my company commander, Ronald Stocker, he was also right there with us too. And these guys, uh, I, I just felt like it was good leadership. I didn't now, see I have any bad experience. Now when you got to the 173rd, you're back in the rear, you see a little higher maybe. I saw quite a bit higher. In fact, it was quite common to run into the commanding general. He was a two-star, and of course our our first sergeant and then all of the XOs and his his staff, you know, he's S2 and all of that. Uh, so uh, how'd you rate them? I, well, it was just a different type of, of leadership, right? It was sort of a back, I, I didn't, uh, the, of course, I didn't see them in the, in the combat reference. I did see them at night. They were in the same bunker I was trying to get away from those rockets. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I felt like it was a good leadership. And one of the things we would do is we would host the combat platoons to an R&R &R site that we had built and set up for right on the South China Sea. And these guys would come in for a day and right out of the boonies. I mean, and they, they could get a meal and, and resupply, get, get ammunition, load up, get clean fatigues, and then back out. And, and that was, uh, so their company commander and their platoon leaders came in and so I got experience with those guys in, in that regard. And I, once again, I didn't, wasn't with them out there in the, in the jungle, but I, I, I sensed that they were pretty good leadership. Boy, every unit in Vietnam should have had one of those little places. It was, uh, it was secure only with barbed wire and claymores. It was right on the coast. Bong Song was on the other side of the coastal mountains. So we had to take a helicopter to get to this little R&R &R site that we built. And we strung the, the, the concertina wire and all of that. And, and so, uh, but it, you, you had to take a helicopter to get back to the base because it was pretty heavily saturated with uh, not friendly uh, enemy over there. Yeah. So. Did a couple of operations through the bomb side including Masher White Wing in 66. Uh, nasty country. Yep. A lot of hills. Where I was in, in with the 1st Division, it was pretty flat, all except for the Black Virgin Mountain, which was called Nui Baudin. Nui Baudin. And it had uh, the 25th Infantry around the bottom and the Green Berets around the top, and then the middle was full of... Enemy. enemy. Yeah, yeah, I remember. But we that. used to use that at nighttime. You could see those the Green Berets had lights out and so you could get your compass, get your bearing on the on the <laughs> mountain. So but up north there were mountains everywhere. So Do you recall any of the named operations in which you participated in the first division or the one seventy third? I really don't. I was uh we, we engaged the enemy with the 1st Division approximately every week, not evenly. Uh, sometimes it was every day, and then we'd go for two weeks without engaging the enemy. And, and, uh, and we had one big uh, firefight where we had sort of walked in on a division of NVA, I think they were, and uh, we got ambushed, and it was a pretty serious fight. We were in that fight most of the day. And that's where I was, that's the, the fight that I was awarded my uh, Bronze Star for Valor uh, because I, I led a, com, a, a group of, of APCs in with some heavy weapons on them and that uh, sort of brought a stop to the, to the ambush, to the conflict. Mm. Did you see any cutting edge technology or science that that 
you witnessed in Vietnam? In my platoon, we, we shared a starlight scope with the whole company. We had one for the whole company, and maybe I got to use it twice. Yeah. So there was, our experience to, uh, to technology really wasn't great. The M16 worked. You, if you kept it clean, it worked. The biggest technology I saw was, was really in the, the air support and the artillery support. Mm. Uh, that was uh, quite good. We Actually, our company observed an arc light mission. So the B-52s came over. You couldn't hear them or couldn't see them. But then you, the bombs, Whoa. we had to clear out, I think, three kilometers away. Yep. Three so, kilometers away. Yep. And then we also had a fire mission from the USS New Jersey. And they shot right over our head, and that's an experience that you, you'd have to live to to get because it's a 2,000-pound projectile that shows... Like a Volkswagen going over. 23 miles. Yeah. A 2,000-pound projectile that shoots 23 miles. And it did. It sounded like a freight train going over the, the top. And so. if any impacted within reasonable distance of you, the earth fell, fell out of beneath you about a foot. And you'd hammer into the ground. Yeah, the the B-52 bombs were cluster bombs, and so they didn't shake the ground. But when that when that Navy round went off, I mean, you could feel it the vibration was an even as far away from as we were. Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly Absolutely. right. Absolutely. So I had that naval gunfire with the Marines, and boom, <laughs> you bounce off the ground, the earth itself. Yep. Amazing. Let's talk about your most vivid memories of, of Vietnam service. Describe the best day you had during your tour. Taking off to go home. Uh, <laughs> I have Get, heard that a few getting times. Getting on that Freedom Bird, and yeah. uh, it was a long trip. They, you know, they, uh, we were, I was up north in Bong Song, and then they sent me down to uh, Not been, uh, not been Cameron. Cameron Bay, yeah. and uh, we waited for a day or so to get uh, the plane, and then the night we were going to take off, the gooks were rocketing the, the airstrip, so they made us wait longer and longer and longer, so it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. They marched us out, and we get on this Flying Tigers airplane, sitting right on the runway, and we sat there, and you could hear rockets going off. And I sat there, I looked at the top of that plane, thinking, oh, there's going to be a rocket come through there. <laughs> and finally, and finally it started moving and took off. And, and when it took off, you, the loudest cheer you could ever hear of that <laughs> plane. So, Describe for us the worst day of your tour. Well, there were several, but um, probably the, uh, the firefight that I was into where I uh, earned my first Purple Heart wasn't such a great day. We got uh, engaged with a uh, VC uh, company, and uh, uh, fortunately, we were able to to win that without taking. I think I was the only casualty, and it wasn't a serious. It wasn't life threatening. So, uh, and then another time was this uh, time that I told you that uh, we got ambushed by. I think they were NBA, and. We, we, we got out of that by bringing some, uh, some not tanks, but APCs in with some heavy gunpowder on that. Probably the worst day was in uh, early January, early to mid-January. We were going out uh, from our fire support base on a, a routine uh, ambush patrol. And at this time, we were walking to the site we were supposed to be and not helicoptering to the site. And so it was in the morning, and we were lined up, heading out, and they assigned me a dog handler. I did have a platoon leader at the time, and so they signed me a dog handler and a dog, which I think was the first time we'd ever had a dog handler. But, but those dog handlers and the dogs were used to, were very good. He was on my right squad, and, uh, and we were going out and we, we got ambushed. And we either, it was either a command detonated ambush or it was, we tripped a wire. But it's unlikely that we tripped a wire because the dog, it was the right flank that got hit the hardest. And the dog was killed, the handler was killed. Uh, my point man, uh, the fellow from, uh, the black man from Tarboro, North Carolina, lost his legs. Mm -hmm. He didn't, he wasn't killed. They medevaced him to Coochie, to a MASH hospital. Uh, and then two other guys, uh, one of them was my squad leader, uh, 
his name was Edward Wittick, we called him Corky, and he got hit pretty badly and the medic came over and we were, uh, medic was giving him um, some blood and I had him in my arms and uh, he had looked at me and then all of a sudden he just died. Oh. And so, and then. Uh, he was your lieutenant. No, he was not. He was my squad leader. Oh, squad leader. He ran the, the right squad, uh, Corky Wittick, and uh, and then one of the, the my one of my ma machine gunners, uh, a rifleman actually, not a machine gunner, uh, from Columbus, Ohio, was killed, and he was he was just dead. And so it was a long day, and we cleaned up our, our from that. They medevac the wounded and dead out of the area, and we're, we're sitting there waiting for orders. That they, Commanding officer Colonel Hobbs sent his EXO in in a helicopter to find out what was going on. So the helicopter, I'm sitting there filling out reports. I'm filling out uh, casualty reports with my medic. My medic's sitting right here. I'm sitting here, and we're both filling out these casualty reports. And the EXO's hop chopper came in. He's hovering right above us, probably 25 feet in the air, and we hear this loud explosion, and the chopper starts spinning. Oh my God! Start spinning and coming straight down, and it spinning, 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 and hit the ground. Doc was sitting here. The ru the rudder hit right there. Whoa! And it hit so hard that it knocked the machine gun off its. You know the the door gunners had machine guns that were yeah. per, per, physically mounted to the helicopter. Right. Knocked it off. It wow. hit that hard, and the bl rotor blade was going on an angle, and you could hear it whoosh, whoosh. You know, and and so your first instinct was to get up and and run, but bad idea. Bad idea. And I look to me, my medic's gone. I don't know where he is, but I see his helmet's crushed under the skid. Whoa. And 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 so I started running the other direction from where the low point of the rotor blade was going, and I got out from from around it. But it was it was a terrible thing. But the good news was I ran into my medic. He got out the, after I guess when the chopper hit. He got out the back side. Uh -huh. I went out this side, yeah. and he was okay. He was alive. Well, the what battalion, about the guy on the chopper? The EXO was killed. I'm I'm pretty sure he was killed. Uh, and then the door gunner got thrown, got thrown out. He was okay. He with was the hurt. gun. With the gun. <laughs> well, the gun went. He went. He went that way. And uh, so then the commander, the battalion commander, called in the jets. Called in. I guess it was. F fours. I'm not. I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, very but, likely. But uh, we were. He told us everybody get down. He identified where the enemy. I think it was command detonated to knock the helicopter down, because the enemy was off to our left. We were exchanging gunfire, and and we could hear the jets coming, and and I heard a lot of planes and jets in my life, but one coming right at you screams so loud oh, you can't yeah. believe it. And he's right here, and he's coming right at us. That's what I'm saying. Somebody tell him that, you know, friendlies are here, you know, and I <laughs> thought sure enough he was going to hit us. And we actually could see the bomb drop, 500 pound bombs drop. Right over your right head. Right over your head. And of course, when they hit, they go off, and then the splash goes away from where the friendly units were. That's right. But still, there's pieces of shrapnel that long were flying behind us and cut down a tree six, eight inches in diameter. Wow. And so, that was probably the worst and the scariest day of my tour. <laughs> you remember what date that was? When it was? I wrote it down. I think it was January seventeenth. Of, of of seventy. Seventy. Yeah, seventy. And so, uh, and, it, and it was shortly after that that, that the first infantry announced that they were going to go take the first back home to Fort Riley. And so they took us back to the brigade rear, which was in Daotiang, and uh, and then waiting for reassignment. Yeah. So we spent a few days back in the base base camp. How much, if any, contact did you have with our allies, the Koreans, the Aussies, Thais, Filipinos, New Zealanders? So one time with the Australian pilot, as I told you. That's it. And one time with the Korean rock soldier, Republic of Korea soldier. My dad had told me that he had served with Korean soldiers in World War II in Korea. He, that, my dad was also in Korea. Hmm. And uh, he said, they're tough soldiers. Yeah. So we had captured 
this was back with the first division maybe sometime back in November something like that we had captured a, a prisoner and so they called in military intelligence to interrogate it happened to be a female apparently she was a pretty high-ranking uh, captive and so the MI, the military intelligence guys were interviewing her right there in the midst of where our company was, our platoon was, and she wasn't talking. She was no BIC, right? That means they don't speak English. But um, So finally, the MI guys brought in this Korean interrogator, <laughs> and it was amazing. She took one look at him, and she started bicking. She started talking, She's talking, 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 because yep. she, I guess they, his reputation preceded him or something. But not him, all of them. All of them. But uh, they, so, they would occasionally skin one of them alive. Yeah. So she led us. Her confession led us to the largest weapons cache I think that had been found. In fact, we. We made the front cover of Stars and Stripes, and I've, <laughs> I've still tried to find that edition. I can't find it, but uh, but the company commander had me digging all these weapons out. We found all kinds of Chinese-made uh, weapons, yeah. uh, just a whole bunch of them. And one of them I dug out was uh, a lot of them, SKSs, and the company commander gave me the SKS for, for finding and digging out all these weapons. And yeah. so, Getting that thing home was a. That I thought it was story. tough going through becoming a landed immigrant. Getting that that SKS rifle home was <laughs> was more. <laughs> so, anyway, <clears throat> but that, and then and then the Arvin troops. We dealt with the Arvin troops uh, quite a bit uh, because we had the joint fire base. Right. And then we actually had a Chuhoi scout in my platoon that was assigned to me, who was an Arvin. Uh, he was an Arvin soldier that, or he was actually a VC that that. Surrender, Chuhoi. Chuhoi. And then they, they put him through a course and then they become advisors. So, so <laughs> you're just never sure. But, but he was a good kid. He was a young man and, and he was helpful to, uh, to communicate with the village elders. Uh, so that's how we used it. The, the next question is what were your impressions of the Vietnamese people, civilians, that you had anything to do with? Villagers, townspeople, yeah. et cetera. So the villagers, we go into villages a lot, and the village people uh, seem friendly. They seem, you know, they have little hooches, grass huts, and so forth. They seem somewhat friendly. But in the area we were in, we had a lot of VC. And so and we, we knew that some of the same people in the village by day were VC at night. Yeah. So you just never knew for sure. Now, I did have a chance to meet, I, when I was with the 173rd, they sent me to Saigon, and I had a chance to meet some some civilian uh, Vietnamese people in Saigon and, and uh, one family invited me into their home. They were very nice and they were very respectful to the Americans for helping their country. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I didn't really have a lot of exposure to, to uh, other allies. How much contact did you have with your family back home? So not much. Letters. My mom would send us, uh, we'd send exchange letters and I would uh, Every once in a while, she would send a care package, which was nice. Yeah. Cookies and hot sauce yeah. for your sea rations. And uh, the guys would help you eat it. Yeah. Well, you trade. You know, nobody liked ham and eggs, so you trade for, for a pound cake, and and so you did a lot of trading. I happened to like ham and eggs, so I was, I would get a lot of ham and eggs. <laughs> if you had to eat them cold, though, if you tried to heat them up, they were terrible. So. Yeah. But, uh, and then. The time I was selected to go home with the colors and then got my orders changed, I was able to call my mom and dad on a Mars station. And back then, the Mars station it probably stands for something, but uh, it was a whole series of patchwork telephone calls through right. different places all around the world. Shortwave, yes. and then ham radio, hook up to a local operator and do a collect call to your mom. Exactly and then right. you got to teach her how to say over. And working. Working. If you, didn't, if you had to keep saying working, if you didn't say working, they'd unplug you and plug in the next guy. Yeah. You know? And so yeah. <laughs> I finally got to talk to my mom and dad, and it was, it was great to hear their voice. And yeah. So, but, but other than letters, that was about it. How much news did you get about the war you were fighting and about the wars that were going on back home? Uh, Stars and Stripes? 
Well, we didn't get Stars and Stripes out in the field. We Occasionally there'd be a, 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 a copy back at the fire base. Yeah. That was you guys that were coming in to our, uh, to our company and our platoons. Yeah. So we'd get a replacement guy who would come in and he would tell you, you know, oh. what happened at, at this. The most shocking news that I got when I was over there was about the Kent State. Kent State. Deal because I was from Ohio. Yeah. And Kent State was a, a college in northern Ohio. And apparently the riot happened because the president allowed us to go into to Cambodia, which was the best thing that anybody could have done, because the gooks would run right back to the line and they would get refuge there because we, we weren't allowed to chase them into Cambodia. We were right on the Cambodian border. And so... Um, but we were bombing the crap out of them. You, you, it was hard to tell because when we would be on a, our Eagle flights in a helicopter, you could look down and you could see the surface of South Vietnam was pockmarked with bomb craters, bomb craters everywhere. And on the other side of some imaginary line, it was no bomb craters. Yeah. That, there probably were bomb craters, but it just it was, was obvious. It was further in. Yeah, it must have been farther in. But, yeah. uh, but that was, you could tell where you were close to the border because bomb craters, no bomb craters. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the, you may know this or not, but the bomb craters, a 500 pound bomb will create a pretty big crater. It's a cone shaped crater, maybe 25 or 30 yards across. They turned them into fish And they fish filled up almost and... overnight with water. Yeah. And clear as a bell water. Crystal clear water. But they warned you not to drink it because it was full of bacteria, right? Yeah. And so, sure enough, we're on an ambush patrol one night and one of my men started having stomach cramps. And he started having them so bad that he was he was in agony. He was screaming. And, you, I, you know, on an ambush, you, don't you want can't that. have anybody letting... And so I had to call, actually call in the health, uh, dust off to take him back. He had leeches growing in his stomach. Oh my God. And so the poor guy, but they, I mean, he was okay after they fixed him up, but we had to pick up and move because we had been compromised, right? Our location. You certainly had, Ollie. <laughs> so, so uh, but anyway, so, so the news we got, I think we heard about Kent State. Um, um, and then, one time, the vice president, who was Spiro Agnew at the time, came to our fire support base because it was the model base for Vietnamization. So he came in <clears throat> on a big Chinook, he, he and his crowd, and then he had another Chinook full of reporters. There must have been 30 of them, all running around. Our unit just happened to be in the base camp, or in the fire support base that day, <clears throat> doing pulling security. So I didn't get to meet the vice president or anything, but I got interviewed by some of the reporters. Mm. And, uh, so <clears throat> now, while you were there, do you have a memory of marking the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas? The only day, the only time you knew what day it was was Mondays because we had to take the big malaria pill on uh, Monday. We took little pills every day yeah. for malaria, the Dapson, but the big one on Monday, and you knew that was Monday. And then you generally knew the holidays were coming up, but what was significant about Thanksgiving was the company commander would send helicopters in with hot food. So we had turkey and dressing out in the field. Out in the field. At the French Fort, actually, is where we had our first hot meal. And then at Christmas, the same thing. You'd get, you'd, hopefully you would get a hot meal at Christmas. So Were that, those, those the only hot meals you got in the field? That tour. If we went back to the fire base, we could get a, a, a one, the day we were in there resupplying. We also pull guard duty for the fire base when you're there, but you could get a hot meal there too. B rations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and they had the milk they had was like reconstituted milk, and they would make ice cream out of it. And it just it just wasn't wasn't the same. So <laughs> no, not quite, not quite. Tell us about your, well, before we go there, is there anything I haven't asked you about that you want to talk about? Uh, well, I think I've probably rambled through most of it. I told you a little bit about the confidence that the battalion camp commander had in me and offered me a battlefield commission. I still wonder if I should have taken that, but... Uh, yeah, I got to tell you, that was, uh, there were only 60 Battlefield commissions handed out in Vietnam. Really? Yeah. I'll be darned. A rare bird. And I, I told you about <clears throat> the worst day of my life over there, and and uh, you know, I mean, it, it was a, a a long time, and and uh, some happy moments, 
some sad moments, um, but uh, and the people you met. I mean, I ha I haven't been able to keep up with with any of the the people. The, the one person that was was my squad leader that got transferred up to Americal Division really was was very hurtful for me. And so when I got home, after a while, I reached out to his parents. They lived in Indiana. And being in, a, in Ohio, it wasn't that far to go. And I can remember Steve telling me that he, he, his dad was an alcoholic. Mm. And his dad would beat him. He had a sister, and, and it was pretty ugly. And so he obviously didn't have very much respect for his father. So I called him, and I had taken some pictures when I was over there. And so I got all my pictures, and I sent them to his family. And I actually wound up actually in, in meeting his his family talking to his dad. The day that Steve was killed, his father quit drinking. Hmm. And he was, he didn't drink a drop from then on. He was <clears throat> part of AA, and he actually came out to visit me. I lived in California for some time afterwards, and he came to visit me in California, and he probably drank three pots of coffee all day, uh, but he never drank a drop of alcohol after he learned that his son was killed, hmm. which I, it still stuck in my mind for that. I. I reached out to the other families of the members that were killed, and I was never able to get in touch with Corky's family. I sent them, they were Chicago. I sent letters and stuff, but I never heard back. <clears throat> My rifleman from Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, Mark Tonti, uh, I, I wound up talking to his brother and his girlfriend, and the same questions. Tell me, tell me how he died. We don't know. We don't know what happened, you know? And so I, I didn't share gruesome stories with them, but I gave them, you know, some information that they could hang on to and told them how, how important their family member was to me and to our world, our, to our country, you know, and so, um, and then uh, Bobby Jones is the fellow, my point man, that <clears throat> in the ambush, he, he lost his legs. They, we went to Coochie, a couple of us went to Coochie to visit him, and it was, it was really hard. Uh, he was in a MASH hospital, and he, they had amputated both of his legs, and he and he and he, he would tell me he had a he took a, 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 a pellet or a bullet in the throat, and so he had a tracheotomy, and he he had to talk to us through a tube, so he couldn't talk very well, and mm. um, he he told me he said I ain't got no legs, and it was just it was, and then a week later he, we took we heard that he died, so so I reached out to his family, and I talked to his uh, sister. And uh, apparently Tarboro is just a small little town in South Carolina. It's probably a poor town, and uh, it, was, it was quite moving. And, and that's <clears throat> years ago, uh, our veterans group uh, connected with, uh, with uh, somebody uh, to do pictures, to put pictures up on the web, and it was the virtual wall where we could post pictures. So I had pictures. I posted pictures of the men that were killed in my platoon, and, and that's how some of the family members had reached out to me and gotten my contact information. Yeah. So. Mrs. Tate, <laughs> have you thought of any questions you would like to ask your husband? Mm. You've got him on camera and under oath here. <laughs> um, I guess, did you ever get taught Vietnamese, or did you just pick it up? By being there. Yeah, and no, I was never uh, uh, taught Vietnamese. You do pick up some some bits and pieces um, of it. I've been told that when I wake up in the middle of the night having a nightmare that I'm speaking Vietnamese. <laughs> Other than a, a few words about beer and, and, and different types of food, I don't know that I know how to speak any Vietnamese. But you can speak Ba Mi Ba. Ba Mi Ba and Ba Mi Ba Mi Ba Mi and, and yes, exactly. <laughs> ba Mi Ba is a beer. I got it. 33 I, beer. Actually, uh, somebody brought me three bottles of Ba Mi Ba. I got it up in my bookshelf. Nice. <laughs> Nice. Tell us now about going home. Well, they, uh, we got on the Freedom Bird, the Flying Tigers, and we left, uh, uh, left Vietnam, and, and uh, we probably stopped along the way. I don't remember much about that. But we landed at Fort Lewis uh, at SeaTac, and then they took us to Fort Lewis from there to be uh, out-processed. Yeah. And 
I can remember them going you through. You were a, done with the Army. I was not out of the Army, but I was uh, done with active duty. Ah. I was on a, I was placed in a reserve unit, yeah. but I was in active reserves at the time. And I stayed there for the following four years. But <clears throat> I remember them going through all of our records, making sure that we had, you know, all of our awards and, and things were properly. And I, that was sort of like happening real quick. And I remember them giving me a hearing test because I had um, some hearing issues. And, uh, and then they gave us some other tests. But I remember them most saying, you got to get out of th these clothes and into some civilian clothes as quick as you can because you do not want to be wearing your uniform through the airport. Well, I didn't have any civilian clothes. and We were on post the whole time, so yeah. there was no place to get them. So um, uh, I flew from SeaTac or from Seattle to Chicago and couldn't get a flight from Chicago to Dayton until the following day. So I went up to the USO and I spent that evening in the USO. I think I slept in a chair or something like that. And they, they gave us some food. And USO is great. I can't say enough good things about the USO. They are terrific. And, uh, they are. And our group, our veterans group, volunteers for the USO. And it is so heartwarming. Johanna's been down there with me. And God love her. Uh, she gives all these people a hug. And here we are marching them back to the airplane to send them back to a combat assignment in either Af Iraq or Afghanistan. And yeah. It's just... Uh, so I, I spent the night in... Chicago, and you could just see people looking at you, civilians in the airport, and not wanting to be near you or not wanting to look at you, and and um, it was pretty, it was pretty chilly. I didn't have anybody spit on me, but it was pretty chilly. And then when I the next day I flew to to Dayton and was greeted by my family, which was a much warmer reception. Uh, but it was still a long time uh, before you really felt like anybody appreciated the fact that you made it home, so. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't take you at Fort Lewis to the PX and let you buy an ugly plaid shirt. <laughs> I, 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 for some reason, I don't recall that being offered. I remember <laughs> going through, and I remember the, 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 the person saying, giving me my, my uh, DD-214 and saying, are these all your awards? And I looked at it, and, and I said, well, I, I think so. And, and uh, I, I, I said, I remembered having a good conduct ribbon. Well, I said, well, it's not on your DD-214, so you don't have one. <laughs> so originally, when we had our medals made up, I had the good conduct. I remember having the con good conduct ribbon. They said, no, if you don't have it, it's not on your DD-14. You so I sent my medals back, and I had them no, no good conduct medal. But in preparing for this interview, I went through all of my records, and sure enough, I found my good conduct orders. Uh, so I, I've got to go back and get my medals. Go back and get your well, medals. Well, because I was, they told me at Fort Benning when I was there as a, as a basic E1, they said, now, don't get a ticket, because if you get a ticket, that's a DR, and you're not going to get a good conduct ribbon. So I've always been sort of trying to do the right thing in my life, you know, and I said, well, I don't want to get in trouble, then I won't get my... Good conduct ribbon, yeah. <laughs> so, but I, ha I found it. I have one. <laughs> so, do you have any difficulty readjusting to civilian life after you came back from Vietnam? I got back into back in back home in uh, sort of mid July, I think it was about the 18th or 19th of July. 1970. In 1970, correct. And it was so wonderful to be back home, uh, sleeping in a warm bed, eating hot food, listening to the toilets flush. I hadn't heard that sound in a long time, you know. <laughs> so if people that haven't been there wouldn't understand what that's all about. But uh, <clears throat> but my dad took Sit me downtown. Down on the toilet and not smell gasoline? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So that one, of the, one of the things was, what's your memory of your first memory of Vietnam in terms of smells. Well, I landed at Benoit, and you could see these black smoke going up where they were burning the barrels. The, the barrels. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's a that's an odor that you can never forget, right? That's right. And so, uh, but Dad took me downtown, and somebody must have had a leftover firecracker from Fourth of July, and he and I were standing on the corner waiting for light, and he, some, the firecracker goes off, and instinctively I hit the ground. I mean, a cement sidewalk, and there I am on the ground in civilian clothes and just feeling like a fool, you know. But Dad had been in World War II and Korea, and I think he sort of understood, you know, what it was. But uh, 
and, and you know, other than I, I went to the VFW and I was thinking about joining the VFW and they said, well, you're not eligible. Vietnam's not a real war. And I thought, you know, that's pretty cold. Yeah. And, and I never they forgot that. They came to regret that. Oh, yes, they did. And now the VFW... The Vietnam they, guys <clears throat> run the all of the veteran organizations. Well, and, and now the VFW is very anxious for you to join their oh, groups. I never yeah. joined. Uh, I think I joined the American Legion, <clears throat> but I'm not active in that. And I'm, I, I belong to a Purple Heart Club in Athens, Georgia, and so I'm not very active in that either. So, But the readjustment to life, I, I eventually got a job, and a, a good job, and, and so I got back into society and tried not to think about Vietnam, tried not to watch the news at night because of hearing all the people that were being killed, you know, and having been there, it's personal, right? Yeah. And so um, I didn't watch any movies, I didn't <clears throat> read any books, didn't want to talk about it for the longest time. And I think it was like the early 90s, right here in Atlanta, some, some person said, you ought to come to our Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association meeting. I said, no thanks, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. I, I did go and I met some very nice people and, and lo and behold, they weren't talking about the war. They were talking about business. Or they were talking about politics or something like that. So I went back, and it's been a great, great uh, association. And yeah. it's therapeutic. It really is, as, yeah. you, as you well know. Yeah. <clears throat> now, after you get done with the Army, or at least your two-year draft tour, uh, did you go back to college? No, you already had a degree. I completed college. I went, I went to work in a professional uh, career. Okay, doing what? Well, I was an industrial engineer for NCR Corporation in Dayton, Ohio. NCR to Dayton was sort of like Coca-Cola is to Atlanta. Right. And now, of course, NCR moved to Atlanta, so who would have, who would have guessed that? But uh, <laughs> <clears throat> no, I had a professional career and, and then eventually got transferred to a different company and and uh, one of the transfers I got was to Canada. And this was probably four, five, six years after I'd returned. And during my stay up there, I ran into draft dodgers. And that was not a, a, a friendly, warm thing for me to do. I resented those draft dodgers, and I didn't want to have anything to do with them. And, uh, and they, the ones that I talked to, they found out I was a Vietnam veteran. They wanted to try and explain their story, right? No, I don't want to hear it. I said, no, I don't want to hear that. There is no explanation. You could have done a lot of things. In fact, my first medic, at the, with the first CEO infantry, was a conscientious objector, yeah. and that guy, and there we were in combat. He would carry extra canteens instead of a rifle, yeah. and and I and we were on the battlefield, and one of my men would get hurt, and there's Doc crawling out to to bring him back under live fire with no gun, and dragging yeah. the person back yeah. to a safe area, and so y you can say what you want to, but there was no excuse. You could those guys, gone. I have nothing but the highest respect for. And there were others who were conscientious objectors who were offered a two-year tour at private's pay with a charitable organization or something here in the <coughs> States, or 18 months in federal prison, your choice. Uh, and those who stood for that, I, that's okay. They did national service of a sort. But the ones who ran away to Canada, I think they should still be there. I do too. I don't think they should ever be allowed back in this country. But my only experience with a conscientious objector was, I said, my medic, and he was, he was amazing. There were a lot of them. There were a lot of them. I have nothing but respect for the medics. Have you? maintained any contact with people that you served with in Vietnam? The only person, or two people, uh, my platoon leader, who I only had for a relatively short period of time, lives in Texas, and we send Christmas cards back and forth every year. And then the, the platoon leader for the second platoon uh, lives in Colorado, and I send Christmas cards to him. But other than that, I haven't had any uh, any way to reach the people. I, I understand the First Division has a reunion, but I've never participated in that. I don't really know much about it. Boy, the First Division Association's the richest of all the division associations. They, they're they headquartered out of Chicago on old Colonel McCormick's estate. Really? And there's a First 
division museum up there that is knock your eyes out. And they, you know, have authors in. I, General Moore and I did lectures there three or four times. And uh, they got a wide field around the museum that's got all kinds of tanks and armored cars and artillery pieces. You ought to go see it sometime. I will do. I think we were driving back sometime from out west and we went through Fort Riley, Kansas. And I remember pulling off just to see the home of the Big Red One, you know, and then uh, yep. uh, somewhere else. Oh, I know, when I went to, uh, I went to the beaches at Normandy and uh, they had a, a Big Red, or First Infantry Division uh, place where they recognized the Big Red One men who had been killed at Normandy. Colonel McCormick gave, uh, you know, quite a few million dollars to the First Cab, First Division Association. He was a World War I veteran. Really? And, and he was so proud of it, he got a French Legion of Honor, and he's got it carved, it was carved into the oak floor in his library, the whole inscription really? of his uh, his Croix de Guerre uh, in French. I'll be darned. <laughs> He's very proud of it. They gave him a lot of money. Well, the cemetery in Normandy is, you know, talk about tax dollars. That's the best use of tax dollars I've ever seen. That is immaculate and it's well maintained and it's really an honor. And, and oddly enough, the French people all around that area are so warm and friendly to Americans. You bet. Not so much in Paris, but, but certainly by, the, by Normandy and the other beaches there, they're very friendly. Even the young people who have to be like great-great-grandchildren or great-grandchildren of the, of the people who fought there are still warm. I mean, they, they carried on through their generations. And, and you shouldn't, you know, the Parisians hate everybody including each other. <laughs> so you gotta go to the country to find real people in France. Do you feel that your Vietnam experience changed you and affected your life afterward for good or for less good? It definitely did. I mean, it's one, when you think back over your life, I'm just turned 75, and you think back over your life in Vietnam and serving in that war is one of the most vivid memories that I have of all the things that I've done. And, and I, I, I've been asked this before and I really think that, that serving in the Army, the military in general, but specifically the Army, the Army teaches you leadership. The other, the other branches, the, the Air Force and the Navy, they, they teach you skills. Yeah. The Army teaches you leadership. And when you get, and for me, I was a relatively young staff sergeant, and they put me in charge of a company of a platoon right away, and I was in charge, you know. And so you not only learn leadership, but you learn discipline. You learn uh, other other traits that uh, that help you in life and in, in business. And fortunately, uh, some of those traits have paid off for me in, in my business career. I've had a pretty successful business career that I'm very proud of, and I think it I give a lot of the credit to my time in the military. Mm. My dad was a military person too, and so he sort of, in, in, we had that growing up, right? We, we took care of ourselves and we did the right thing, and he, he inspired that to my brother. My brother this past was a Marine, and, and then, so Paul and I were the only two in the family that had military experience other than my dad, but we, we got raised with that, with that sort of sense of doing the right thing. Did your time in Vietnam affect the way you think about the troops coming back from combat today? Oh, it certainly did. For, and the way we were treated, both coming back and then after that for many years, uh, and then to this day, the men and women, you know, one of the things we've, we have learned, I have learned in talking to young people that are on active duty or military today, you know, war hasn't changed much. Not much. What's changed is the technology. I mean, they have great technology, but when it comes to killing and fighting, that hasn't changed much. And so today, these young men and women are so well-trained and they're, they have so much preparation and they're, we're just so proud of them. I mean, it was our honor and Johanna and I would go down to the USO to welcome these 
folks back and then send them off back to back to a combat zone and it's, it's just you're so proud I mean I would get to lead a whole group of them maybe 30 or 40 of them and you'd be in the USO and you'd go down the escalator into the main lobby of the, of the Atlanta airport and you'd I would be in charge of that and so I would holler out to everybody we're taking these people back and please give my hand and so everybody would clap and applaud and it all was good that's my payback and when when you when you do that our our veterans group has a we have a scholarship fund that we raise money to give scholarships to young men and women coming back to help them with their education to come back and and we give 100 pennies of every donated dollar to the veteran not not a penny goes to buy postage stamps or anything else and I sort of dubbed it one generation of veterans helping the next but today's veterans are just salt of the earth I'm just sorry that more people aren't in the military I mean and so I think one of the questions I saw was how do you feel about the draft and and would you I bring think it we back? ought to bring it back. I think we ought to bring it back too because when I was drafted I was a group out of Dayton Ohio but there was a group out of Michigan or Detroit and a group out of Florida. We all came together at Fort Benning in one big company. And the guys from Detroit, there's several of them, that were uh, in jail <laughs> and said, either stay in jail or go to jail or go, go in the to army. the army. And I can remember this one guy, Alan Beal, big, tall guy. He must have been 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, had an afro out to here, every other tooth missing. <laughs> and he had come right off the streets of, of Detroit. And he... he joined the army instead of going to jail. He would have been in jail. One year later, I saw him. He, his hair was cut, his teeth were fixed, he was strack, he, and he was going to make the military a career. That's what the military did <laughs> for people like that. Yeah. And there's still people on the streets that could use that discipline and use that guidance. Maybe they didn't get it at home. One of the veterans that we honored with a scholarship was a, a, a foster child that grew up on the streets of Detroit. He didn't have any parents, didn't know who his parents were. All he knew is he had foster families. And he made his way to go to college to get out of that that and, he, and going in the army was one of the ways he did that and he was one of our scholarship recipients wow is there anything i haven't asked you that you want to talk to last chance you've been pretty thorough and, I'll, and before we end this i want to thank you and general moore for what you did because I think We Were Soldiers was the first movie, that I, the first Vietnam movie that I ever saw. I refused to watch Platoon or any of those others. I just didn't want to see them. I but walked I, out on all of them. I watched We Were Soldiers, and of course, being filmed in Fort Benning, I, I recognize some of those streets in the movie, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I think that movie brought so much awareness to what real life was and the cabs coming up and the orderly coming up and giving the, the news, the, the report that their loved one had been killed. I mean, a lot of people told me they didn't know that that's how it happened, you know? And, and Telegrams from the cab driver. Exactly right. And so oh. I think what you guys did and, and the whole effort that went into it has, has just been invaluable in, in really creating awareness of how ugly war is, not just for the soldier, but for the, the women or men and women now that stay home and have to support the family while their loved one is in combat. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Now, have you ever been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C.? Yes, I have a number of times. What are your thoughts when you <laughs> go there? Well, it's very moving. The first thing I do is I look up the men that I lost and, and we find their names and pay our respects to that. We were up there about a year ago, I think, for the 50th anniversary celebration. Uh, we were, a bunch of us from our veterans group were invited to go up and we actually received our, our pin and, and uh, they had a ceremony right at the wall. Mm. And it was, it was very moving. And uh, uh, it, you can't go there and see that wall uh, without feeling um, just sadness because the the names just go on and on and on and on, and you and you just think about the four names that I know personally, and I'm, there may be other people that were killed that I I don't know that are on the wall, but I just don't know that. Don't know. But it. the four people that I lost that were close to me, I mean, each one has a story. Each each family, like I told you, Steve Bainey's family. His dad was an alcoholic, never drank a drop after 
He learned that his son died. I mean, every single one of those 58,000 names has a story behind it. And that story needs to be told somehow. And thanks to the to Sue and the History Center for what you all are doing with the Veterans History Project and what you're doing here. It, it's taken me a long time, Sue, and I know that she has pestered me to death to about <laughs> getting down here and doing this, and I'm glad I did it. Thank you so much. You've heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War commemoration. What do you think about that? I think it's a great thing that the government's done to, to recognize and honor uh, the men and women that served. I really do, and, and the pen was was very nice. There have been several pinning ceremonies. I got mine when I was in D.C. and Excellent. So Excellent. they actually came to our veterans group. I think you were there, I'm not, maybe not at the same time, but... Um, Sergeant Tate, thanks for coming in. Thank you, sir. Thanks for telling your story. Thank you very much.